so I'm trying to think. We've done four or five Kawakami stories together. I know I've done her books. You've mostly done just the short stories. Are you starting to see it? Like, are you starting to see why she's such an important writer to me, the power behind her pen? Oh, you stole my word. She is so powerful, and she makes you feel things in such a short story. Mm -hmm. I was ashamed after reading Shamed. Yeah. What I also found interesting before we get too deep into the story is that when it says the title is Shame, whose shame is it? And I think that's a very interesting question that we need to talk about here because it's all a matter of perspective. And I think mm. that one person is internalizing while the rest of society, it's externalizing. And that's what makes Kawakami such a strong writer is that laser focus. Like there's thought put behind even something as a singular word as the title for this story. And and she doesn't beat around the bush, right? We jump right into it and we start out dreaming about when we are still alive. And we're like, when she was 15, and they start talking about her slender body, right? And you're like, okay, I get it. She, she was in shape. She felt, you know, she felt good with her body, how she like kind of like had eyeballs on her essentially. But then it hits you right away. You'll have these quotes where she says, although that body had clearly belonged to her, in reality, it had never been her own. People around her were always telling her how much every part of her was worth. And yes, exactly to your point about how other people are telling you what you're worth or prescribing to you your value. And, and that's a good question of how much of value is intrinsic and how much of it does come from society and, and the meeting of the me with the we. And I've always had that question. And it, again, it makes me feel, I don't want to say lesser of myself, but I do think about it now as an older individual of when you're talking with your friends and saying things that you would never say otherwise or even think out loud and you do, you you have contributed to that problem of, you know, basically over sexualizing people. And I think that that is so harmful, uh, especially in a nowadays society where, you know, we are so on screen, uh, you know, on social media that uh, it, it's even it, it's gotten even worse. Well, it's one of those things, too. It's like there's like this invisible line, right? And, and obviously there's a, there's a part where it's too far, but the idea of feeling attractive, the idea of finding something attractive, seeing beauty, there's nothing wrong with that at some level, right? Like those are good, healthy things in my opinion. And I think what Kawakami expresses here so, so artfully is how the things that are being prescribed to her are so foreign to who she is, right? When when that's all you see is the attractiveness of the slender waist and, and, the, and the breasts and such, and, and you stop there, well, that's when we have a problem because that's what you are, but not necessarily who you who you are being, your isness, if you will. It's your externalization that you almost have very little control over sometimes. Yes, your isness. I like that because she does say in the story that when is it that she is a woman first, or when is it that she's an uh, a sexualized object first and a woman second, or just a person in general? And that is very, very true. Of how does one identify oneself? Is it your gender, your gender identity? Is it your hair? Is it a specific attribute of your body? Is it your eyes? Those things, while you said are, you know, things that people can be attracted to, but what is it when it becomes that is all that matters? That's what you see as a definition of a person. And I think that's when it becomes an issue or a problem. Right. And we see how in like kind of like part two of this, she she really pushes that envelope where you see her just like eating like what was it like the demi glaze or whatever, like all the the, the sugar and everything. And you're like, oh, wow, she's she's really going down like that indulgence route. Right. And you're like, OK, that's that's much different than the girl that cared about her slenderness. Did she stop caring? And that's when you start reading more and more into it. And you're like, oh, this is her wall. She no longer wanted to be attractive or sexualized to the point where she's trying to sabotage it, sabotage her own body by specifically trying to eat fatty foods. Right. And you hear her hearing uh, other women almost kind of like, you know, they're talking about the woman that was attacked against her will. 
and they say something to the effect of like, oh, well, she asked for it. Do you see the way she was dressed? Right. Like the, the idea of of the lure being something that like men couldn't resist. And so she asked for for that to happen, because, of course, what would happen if she dressed a way that was was overly sexualized? Of course, she's going to get attacked. And and the way she just dives into the eating, it was it was this like this toxic miasma that was just kind of in the scene that just it just choked you as a reader when you're like, oh, like, I feel like I need to inject myself and start talking for some reason here because there's there's some problems here, people we need to talk about. Yeah, you, you wanted to stand up and go over to those ladies at the table and, you know, give them an earful. And I guess that's what's really unique about this story is it is from the complete idea of women and, you know, women not supporting women. And it goes back to that old, you know, very patriarchal society adage of, oh, it's just boys being boys. Well, no, like just because a woman dresses a certain way doesn't mean you get to ogle at her. doesn't mean you get to say inappropriate things. That's not what a decent person would do, uh, you know, in, or that that idea of, oh, I can just look at the menu. And it's like, no, that's not, you know, that's not being faithful. I mean, especially if you're in a committed relationship, that's not something, something that you should do. And I feel like here it, it's even compounded even further in the fact that 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 the narrator doesn't feel that she is being supported by people that should be supporting her the most and that she feels the only way out of this is to be, you know, unhealthy, that, that she uses the layers of fat as that shield, as you said, to protect her. Now, when we say these things, it's very easy to throw out these comments, right? Like, you can easily, like, almost be like the White Knight by, by denouncing the evils. <sighs> How do we how do we temper this? Because in Japan, I, this is true in a lot of cultures, but but there's there's a Japanese element to this that if you are not attractive to other men, it's considered shameful. And and, and I'll pull up some link, right? Like to, to, to it won't be hard to find. But this is something that that you know our Japanese instructor in school would would educate us on that it wasn't just like what's wrong with me, like you felt shame upon yourself. Like this is part of the whole, you know, there's a difference in how the Japanese look at ending their life versus how we do. Like they take pride in, in not allowing the enemy to take their life from, from back in the samurai days. Right. Well, same thing with women here where there is a social currency that you get from the eyeballs. So, so that's almost something that you kind of cash in on in some regards too. So, while you don't want to just be that object and while there's nothing wrong with being attractive in order to be a part of this social engine, sometimes you have to play the game at some level. You know what I mean? Yeah, I definitely think that there is a uh, societal difference here between what is maybe East and West that this is, I don't know the specific to Japanese culture, but I think that it is definitely heightened more in their mm -hmm. culture. And mm -hmm. I think that the, the women believe this as much as the men do, so they're okay with it to some regards, mm. right? They reinforce it, right, by not opposing yes. it. You, when when you don't oppose a social standard, you are reinforcing it on some levels. And we see that with the daughter, right? When uh, the daughter is picked up, the daughter is ashamed of how her mom looks, and even the other children are kind of teasing her of, you know, that's not what you know a woman should look like in our society and culture, and they learn it from a young, young age that that is not how you are supposed to appear. That's how you're not supposed to take care of yourself. They just yeah. don't realize the the mental trauma and the physical trauma that this woman has gone through, and that's why she's behaving this way. That's why she's going against the cultural norm. Have you ever heard of the uh, Japanese word shikan? You might have told me it to me once or twice. <laughs> I doubt it. Uh, no? Okay. It's the term about when, it's what happens in part three here, where, well, well, okay, first of all, we learned that she was attacked, and this is kind of like a repressed memory, and that's what kind of spawned a lot of this uh, outward activity of her, you know, trying to gain weight. But Shikan, Shikan is where women are groped on subways. The idea that when they walk by, a man just, you know, grazes his hand against her, her rear. Or they might like press up against their breasts and, and get aroused in a sense. What happens in the story, it's not that it happens all the time, but it happens enough that there's a freaking word for it. 
in Japanese, right? So this is something that, again, is just reinforced into the culture that I don't think, I think most women, a high percentage of women don't want it. They don't like it. But there's some women that that's a currency in some regards, like to have been attractive. It's, it's, it's such a strange spiral, the fact that there's such toxic behavior that there's even a word for it in Japan. Okay, so it's that idea of at least somebody wants me. Well, we have that quote, you know men get turned on by that kind of thing. I can't get properly hard if you don't seem a bit reluctant. Come on, women are supposed to be ashamed of sex. So her own husband that she marries, right? There's something about them resisting, the chase even, because it's expected for them to be treated as objects of chase and for them to almost be repulsed by it. That it's something that is is very cultural. I don't want to come off and say that that's wrong, but 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 what is that about Japan, right? And and finally, right? Not that, that Kawakami is the first, but she's definitely one of the strongest voices to stand up and say, "We don't all want this, right? Stop asking me to behave the way that society expects. There are some things here that I need to have as an individual, and this amount of respect." around how I think about myself and my body and what I allow other people to do to my body is something that I need to start standing up for and having a voice for. Well, that makes sense. I I guess it was even more heartbroken as I finally realized that this is probably some truth to this story. There are probably women out there in Japan that this exact same thing happened to them and their only respite was basically becoming morbidly obese so that they didn't have this happen anymore and i wonder if it comes down to not just a cultural thing because i know we've we've mentioned that several times we've kind of harped on that but also is this have to do with religion is this a time sensitive era thing is this been through all of japanese culture i mean if we look back in time and we did some history studying. Is this something that is prevalent through the centuries? Is this a 21st century thing that, that's come about? Because I don't know the answer to that. Is this more biological than anything? Because when it comes down to it, we are animals. Um, and attractiveness is something of how we you know, propagate the species. So I don't know. It's, uh, it's very interesting, though. Very interesting and eye-opening story. And to me, that's an invitation that, you know, if for those of you that are very knowledgeable in this area, feel free to educate us in the comments on certain things. Um, you know, did you find it so, so, so beyond, okay, let's step out of just the straight cultural things. Let's talk about something that we, we do everywhere, right? We will sometimes, okay, so in the beginning, the attack on her, right? The, the cheek on the, the man that attacked her, it's abuse, right? There, there's no question about that. She trades it, though, not for a healthier lifestyle or a way to escape. Like, we see this all the time. You trade it for another form of abuse. The abuse to her body, the abuse culturally and socially to be outcast because she is so chubby, rejecting part of that first form of abuse. You see that all the time. People that have some unhealthy behavior, it's very hard for them to escape to something healthy. They instead trade it for another form of unhealthy behavior. And and that's what is so heartbreaking is, is that downward spiral of how we can just abuse ourselves in so many different ways and almost just move horizontally as opposed to like laterally or vertically out of it. And maybe I'm a little bit on my soapbox, but I, I think, and I'm obviously biased of my wife's uh, profession as a uh, therapist, but I think this is what happens is when the mind breaks, the body pays. And when you don't get help, uh, to mentally get through some type of trauma that you've gone through, your body will pay the price. And even like you said, if you go to something, you know, that is also detrimental, you could go the other way. If you are, you know, assaulted and you're like, I'm going to protect myself forever and you become obsessed with working out and food, that can be just as detrimental to you uh, in, in some regards. Um, you know, there's the, the term like, you know, skinny fat, or you could get fatty liver disease or be taking too many energy drinks or something. I mean, it, it just because it seems healthy or good, you're replacing one traumatic event for a bad behavior, not necessarily just, you know, doing something bad to your body. Yeah. I don't know. There, there's something, there's something so human in the story to your point that we can see. And I think that's the best part about literature is asking that question, 
pointing out things and allowing us to discuss and reflect upon that, right? Like, how do we change? How do we find that escape route to your point about how we deal with these sorts of situations? So I don't know. There, there's something about Kawakami that is just, just absolutely magical. Let us know down below what your favorite work is from Kawakami. Got to make sure I've covered that. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Benuna. Thanks for spending some time with us today. Peace. Peace.